Welcome to Christianity 101, how one man and his story changed history. My name is Matt, and I'll be your professor. Over the next several weeks, I intend to explain to you uh, the basics of the Christian faith. And, and what that means is that for many of you, it, this is going to come as some review, some reminders. Uh, but for some of you, this could be completely fresh information. And especially, I would say, in this day and age when we live in what sociologists call a post-Christian society. Uh, but either way, I hope that these next three classes will help in increasing your understanding of the Christian faith and story, even for those of you who do consider yourselves familiar. Now, obviously, you know this isn't not really a class, and you know that I'm not really a professor. Uh, I'm actually just a local church pastor who felt that it was necessary for believers and unbelievers alike to comprehend the simplicity, everybody say simplicity, simplicity. the simplicity of the Christian faith with the ultimate goal of answering this question. What is Christianity really all about? What is Christianity really all about? Now, certainly, there are elements of our faith which become more complex, and, and there are subjects which people may dispute, even within Christian circles. But I want to help you see through all the complexity and the dispute to understand what the Christian hope really boils down to and how we can live in light of that hope. I find this series to be particularly important for us today, especially because of how the Christian faith has been associated, especially recently, with uh, political persuasions, or cheesy movies, or picket signs, or, or massive crusades in giant stadiums. Uh, unfortunately, if you were to ask someone what they think of when they think of Christians, these sorts of things are the answers they'll give. And those may be the priority for some groups of so-called Christians. But genuine Christian faith centers around certain essential tenets of faith and practice. Those things which are, are fundamental to the Christian life and message. And they are our primary concerns. Other things, you know, the politics, the media, all, all that stuff, that's secondary, tertiary, maybe irrelevant. But if I were to narrow it down even further, more than doctrine or discipline, more than a what is Christianity all about, the Christian faith actually centers around a who. <laughs> An extraordinary man, who he was, what he did, and, and what he calls us to do. And his name, as you probably know, was Jesus. Uh, some say that Jesus is irrelevant these days, that no one really cares or talks about him anymore, but it's my observation that there's probably no one in human history who has talked about more than Jesus. I, I mean, you would be hard-pressed to find anyone who doesn't have at least some take on the man Jesus Christ, even if it might be a negative take. Historians on all sides of the faith spectrum have agreed that there was at least a first-century rabbi from a Middle Eastern town called Nazareth whose name was Jesus. And there was also countless records outside of the Bible which testify to his life on earth as well as the revolution that he started. I mean, he, he started quite the revolution. And, and so those things, the historical Jesus, is no longer deniable. However, there are also 2.4 billion, everybody say it with me, billion, yeah. 2.4 billion billion people, that's a third of the earth's population, who would tell you that Jesus was more than a Jewish rabbi. That he was more than a Palestinian carpenter who took up his dad's trade. In other words, 
we believe that Jesus was not simply a man like you or me. That he, he was not just a teacher or a moral example. Jesus is the long-awaited uh, Jewish Messiah and the promised Savior of all humanity. And we see hundreds of ancient prophecies that find their fulfillment in him. But what is definitely our most controversial belief is that Jesus is God in human flesh. Fully God and fully man. And if that's true, then that means that God has come to us, which, for the record, sets us apart from most, if not all, other religions. I, I believe this is actually what makes the Christian faith so compelling over other religions. Because other religions will teach some form of spiritual ascent. That you have to work your way up to God through the intellect or through some amount of good works. But we believe that in Jesus, God has actually descended to us. That God came down to us and he put on our limitations. And he faced our suffering. And he experienced our weakness and temptations. But while Jesus lived with us on the earth. He had a very specific mission. He had one single goal, one purpose for his life on earth. And it doesn't mean the other things that he did are irrelevant. But it's important that we understand the actual reason that Jesus came. Some people, they really emphasize his morals, his justice, some people love to talk about Jesus' teachings. Some people emphasize his miracles, his supernatural power. Others have taken his words and, and utilized them for government reform or charity work. But that's not why he came. At least not primarily. Jesus actually revealed the reason he came on many occasions. But it was demonstrated for us at the end of his life. We have many teachings. We have miracles galore from, from Jesus, which we can learn from. But the anchor point of our faith is what took place during the last week of his time on earth. Namely, when Jesus died and rose again. Here's how the Apostle Paul said it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 4. He says, for I delivered to you as of first importance. Everybody say first importance. first importance. For I delivered to you as of first importance that which I also received. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And Paul, he refers to this story as the gospel. Maybe you've heard of gospel music, but you've never heard the gospel story. But gospel means good news. That's literally what the word means. And, and listen, who couldn't in this room use a little more good news today? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is this good news that Paul describes, which gives us joy and peace in life. Everything comes back to that story. You know, people in the church, they get way too caught up in other affairs. And people outside of the church, they wrongly assume what Christians believe. But when the scriptures talk about the greatest, most essential conviction for followers of Jesus all around the globe, not just here in East Mauritius, this is it. This is of first importance. Why? Why is Jesus' death so significant? So what? He died. Everybody dies, Pastor. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Everybody does die. But it was a very violent way to die. Death by Roman crucifixion on a cross. And I also think it's worth considering that by the time Jesus had died on the cross, history tells us that there were 30,000 men who had already been killed via Roman crucifixion. Not to mention those who would die by this method afterwards. Yet... 
it is only this particular crucifixion of this specific person, which we still talk about today. And then, of course, you might ask, why is Jesus' resurrection so significant? Well, you can't say everyone does that, can you? I'd venture to guess that none of us know anyone personally in this room who walked out of their grave three days after they were buried. I mean, if Jesus rose from the dead, then I suppose the act itself is, is pretty incredible. Um, but what's more incredible is what the resurrection means for us and what it says, or rather, what it confirms about his death. That's why Paul includes both Jesus' death and resurrection in the gospel, not one without the other. Because his death has no meaning from his, uh, apart from his resurrection. If Jesus didn't uh, raise to life, then he is not the promised Savior, nor is he God. And that makes his death meaningless. It makes it just like a death like any one of us will have one day. But the significance of his resurrection derives from what was accomplished and purchased when his blood was shed when he died. So the gospel requires both. And that means that our hope and peace require both. Our joy and contentment require both. Both are of incredible importance if you and I are going to have any reason to celebrate today or any day for that matter. Why? What, what impact, what difference does Jesus' death and resurrection make? And why is this good news so necessary for you and me? To answer that, I want us to look at Matthew's account of Jesus' death and resurrection. Matthew uh, was a wealthy man. He had a solid career. He had a little bit of a shady past. You know someone like that. <laughs> but he recognized something unique about this man, Jesus. I mean, Matthew really had no earthly reason to leave his life and career, to go follow Jesus. But he still left everything behind because he recognized that Jesus is not like those other rabbis and religious, religious leaders. Matthew, he, he tells us in great detail what took place over those last few days of Jesus' life. Sometime very early on Friday morning, just after midnight, Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane after having his final meal with his disciples. And between 4 and 6 a.m., he, he faces several trials in front of his Jewish opponents and other civil leaders like Pilate and King Herod. Around 8 a.m., he is uh, condemned by the crowd to be crucified. We talked about this on Friday, even though he's innocent. And then shortly thereafter, we know that Jesus was beaten, mocked, and scorned. They put a crown of thorns over his head. They spit in his face. I mean, listen, I know any one of you men in this room, you can hit me, but you spit in my face, right? Finally, outside of Jerusalem, just before 9 a.m. on Friday morning, Jesus walks up a hill called Golgotha, but uh, it, the hill had another name, the place of the skull. And that's because it was a common mountain where criminals were put to death. So here we have Jesus, who couldn't be called a sinner, much less a criminal. And he walks up the hill with a man named Simon who volunteered to carry his cross. Around 9 a.m., Jesus' hands and feet were nailed to a tree. And he was lifted up in the air to suffocate and bleed. The Roman soldiers laughing in his face while his disciples and even his widowed mother are down on the ground weeping. Seems pretty dark, doesn't it? This doesn't seem like a very Eastery message, Pastor Matt. Are you sure this is good news? Yeah. I am sure that somehow, in what appears to be defeat and despair, there is good news. 
And Matthew, who wrote the passage I'm about to read, is sure of that too. Would you look with me in your Bibles at Matthew chapter 27? I'm going to take a sip of water. (laughs) Beginning in verse 45, I'll have it with me on the screens as well. Matthew writes, he says, Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And at about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lema shabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of you, or some of the bystanders rather, they heard it and they said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let's see whether Elijah is going to come and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, yielded up his spirit, and he died. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. And the tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of their tombs, after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe, and they said, truly, this was the Son of God. On Friday night, as we reflected on the cross, we raised the question concerning who should take the blame for Jesus' death. Now, um, certainly we could look to the Jewish religious leaders who sought to destroy Jesus, or Pilate for enforcing the death penalty on a man that he knew was innocent, or or the crowd who voted to set a a convicted terrorist free over the meek and mild rabbi. I mean, really? However, we know that the best answer to the question of who is responsible for Jesus' death is actually Jesus and the Father. It was God's will that Jesus would die, and Jesus happily and willingly submitted to God's will. And that's because it was an act of love toward humanity, towards you and me, that he would die in their place, in your place but, but Jesus' self-sacrifice does not permit us to skip over some other important questions, such as, why did Jesus have to die? And also, why do we deserve to die? The short answer to both of those questions is everybody's least favorite S word, sin. What is sin? Sin is anything that we do that goes against God and his character. Sin is anything we do that contradicts God's revealed will uh, will as described in his word. A sin is anything that we do that is not loving toward God or loving toward those around us. Of course, we could make those definitions broader, but these alone are enough to condemn each and every one of us. I mean, come on. Do you really need me or any other preacher to stand here and tell you you're a sinner? I doubt it. It only takes about a day for any one of us to realize how much of a sinner we are. Your temptation to tell a lie, uh, to take something that isn't yours, to curse someone who did you wrong, whatever it is. You've seen it, and you've seen it in those around you. You've seen families that are torn apart because mommy or daddy weren't able to control their passions with a coworker. Uh, You've seen business relationships that were ruined because of greed. You've seen young adults throw their lives away because they wanted a quick thrill. I, I mean, come on. And for what it's worth, 
If you stick around long enough, you'll realize that the people sitting around you are sinners too, myself included. And of course, we're all trying to do what's right, but any one of us would admit that we stumble and fall just like you do. And that means that no one in this room is going to be surprised to find out you're a sinner. And you shouldn't be surprised either. Of course, that doesn't mean we should make light of it. Sin has serious consequences, the greatest of which is death. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Not only physical death, but spiritual death. Death of of joy and peace. At the very least, death describes the absence of the life that God offers. But even if you are alive, you're not living when you go on living in sin. But one of the other difficult consequences of our sin is that it separates us from God. Yes, sin separates us from others. It causes friction in our relationships, doesn't it? When we, when we do wrong, doesn't that cause some, some head, head-on collisions with the people we love? But the most important relationship that we can have is our relationship with God, the one who created and formed us in our mother's womb, the one who loves us more than anyone else could ever love us, the the, the one whose desire is that we could live forever with him. And sadly, our sin brought serious friction to that relationship too because God is holy and we're not. And that gives clarity for the purpose of Christ's death in our place. God hates sin, especially for how it affects us and separates us from him. And we can't live in the kind of intimacy that God desires or the intimacy with God that we crave as humans made in his image simply because of our sin. And God doesn't want us to live apart from him. He doesn't want to punish us or leave us with the penalty. After all, he loves us. He made us. He cares about us. And so that's why Jesus had to come. And that's why we know that the key motivator for God sending Jesus to the earth was not only sin, but much more than that, love. Remember the primary focus of John 3.16? Everybody knows this verse, I think. It's not our sin. It's God's love. God loves us, and that is why he dealt with our sin once and for all with the ultimate goal of reconciling us back to himself through the blood of Jesus. Uh, The apostle Peter, he said it this way, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. That's the chief purpose For Jesus is coming. But in order for us to be reconciled and to experience God's mercy, Jesus had to take on God's wrath towards sin instead. That's where we return to what Matthew wrote in his gospel account. We make it a practice here. If you've closed it already, don't worry. Uh, We leave our Bibles open so you can see what I'm seeing. You know I'm not making up this stuff. Preachers will make up stuff. I don't want to do that, okay? So (laughs) that's the story. I'm an honest guy, I like to think. So in verse 45 and 46, we see the severity of God's judgment on sin. First, we see it demonstrated through creation. All throughout Scripture, Psalm 19, Romans 1, we learn how creation reveals certain things about God and and uh, testifies to his glory. And on this day, the skies were revealing God's judgment and wrath. Look at verse 25. We read now from the sixth hour, which for the Jews would have been about 12 p.m. There was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m. We have several ancient reports, non-biblical Roman manuscripts about this darkness and and how it it seemed to be a global darkness. Some Bible scholars believe this darkness to have been provided by God so that the world might not see Jesus in his nakedness and shame. Uh, Others have said it was dark because the world was putting out the light of the world, which is a common title for Jesus. But darkness in scripture is often associated with God's judgment, especially by the prophets who came a long time before Jesus. 
And that means that the darkness that stood over the cross and the sinners who put Jesus there was a cosmic symbol of God's hatred for sin. And it makes sense that it would happen in these final hours of Jesus' death because there on the cross, he was taking on himself. He was absorbing all of our sin, all of your sin, all of my sin there on that tree. But God's judgment is also revealed in the disturbing question that Jesus shouts from the cross. I'm not going to say the Aramaic, but he, he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He said in Aramaic, the soldiers misunderstood him. It wasn't the first or last time Jesus was misunderstood. We still do it today, don't we? But Jesus asked this question, and it's both haunting and profound. In some sense, it's confusing. I, I don't know that we'll ever understand fully how Jesus, who is God, uh, was separated from God the Father, making God separate from God. I mean, certainly Jesus didn't cease being God or stop being the Son of God. Uh, but all that we can know is that in this moment where, where Christ was bearing in his flesh the sins of humanity, he was experiencing with painful agony, the separation from God that our sin brings. Overall, Jesus spoke a handful of statements from the cross. He didn't speak too much, but he said about seven sentences. And many of them were loving words for the very ones who had crucified him. However, these words reveal the weight of grief that our sin causes. And what we see here in the story is that Jesus Christ took all the grief himself until about 3 p.m. that day when he yielded up his spirit and took his final breath. Why? What would cause Jesus to do that? What, what did Jesus see ahead of this that we would not have seen if we were there on that cross? What, what did Jesus know would happen? The author of Hebrews says, For the joy, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. What was that joy? That's the question which I'd like to answer with two simple statements based off of what Matthew writes here in the passage. First, that although Jesus was alienated from God, we were being united with God. Although Jesus was alienated from God, we were being united with God. I've already said this in several different ways, using different language each time, but the reason that I bring it up again is because of the visual demonstration of this reconciliation with God that Matthew describes here in the text. Uh, this is what happens immediately after Jesus takes his final breath. Look back at verse 51. And behold, the curtain of the temple, your, your translation might say the temple veil, was torn in two from top to bottom, all the way through. Now, unless you took a class on the Jewish religion or the history of Middle Eastern temples, <laughs> or unless you've been in church before and heard a preacher talk about this, you probably have no idea why this is so significant. Okay, somebody's curtains got ripped. Before we talk about that, I want you to notice that this statement, this is written in the passive tense. It doesn't say the curtain tore in two. It says the curtain was torn in two. In fact, if you look at all, there's a long list. There's about six immediate consequences of Jesus' death and resurrection that are listed from our passage in Matthew. And you'll notice that all of them are written in the passive tense. And what that means is that things, these things didn't just happen. But something, or shall I say, someone caused them to happen. And that someone is God himself. Listen, there wasn't a man or a ladder tall enough to rip that curtain from top to bottom. And besides, no human was going to do that anyway with something so sacred. You see, this curtain 
was the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the Jewish temple. It, it was believed that the Holy of Holies was the room within the temple that hosted the presence of God. And, and of course, in some sense, God is everywhere. We know that. But his manifest presence stayed there in that specific place. And the only ones that could access the Holy of Holies was the high priest, and it was only once a year, and it required several steps before they could enter, including a long self-cleansing process. And that means, for the most part, humans were unable to have direct access to God. If they tried to go in, they would immediately die because of their sin, because of their unholiness, and because of their uncleanness. And instead, they had to go through designated priests. They had to go through another man. And it wasn't easy for them to get so close to God either. But now, Matthew says, the curtain has been torn. And this is a God-given visual telling us that there is no barrier. Everybody say, no barrier. <laughs> there is no barrier between, uh, that is keeping us from full access to God and His presence. It tells us that we don't need a special title or a special position to approach God. But any one of us, no matter our background, no matter our spiritual maturity, no matter our education, no matter our past sins and temptations, all of us, every single one of us can come humbly and confidently before God. Because just like the blood of the goats covered the priest before they approached him, Jesus' blood now covers the worst of sinners. Amen? Yeah, yeah. And so you can approach God. Amen. Secondly, I'll stop preaching. <laughs> this is the second piece we learn from Matthew. The death it's only the doorway to resurrection for Jesus and his saints. Just for clarity, this is not in the script. Some of you may have come from other church groups that designated specific people as saints. Saints are any and all who believe in Jesus. But here's what Jesus says. Jesus says in John 10, 18, I read this on Friday night. No one takes my life from me. That means no one, there's not a single person out here who's going to kill me. But I, Jesus, lay it down of my own accord. For I have authority to lay down my life and to take it back up again. Amen. And this charge I have received from my Father. You see, Jesus knew that his death was required in order to take the full penalty of our sin according to God's law. But Jesus also knew that this death was only going to lead to the death of death. And he would walk out of his grave just three days later. In fact, Matthew tells us in the next chapter how the same ladies who watched Jesus die from a short distance away would show up early on Sunday morning to anoint his stinky body. But instead of finding a dead Jesus, they encounter the angel who says to them, I know you're looking for Jesus, but he ain't here, lady. <laughs> he woke up from his slumber, made his deathbed nice and neat, and he walked out. I know you, you thought that he was crucified and that he was. But look, he's not here. He's risen. Come, see for yourself. That's, listen, that's the Matt Horn translation. Obviously. But Jesus knew and even told his followers on many occasions that he'd be raised up. And he believed his father would do it. And if they, and if you, would dare to believe it, then you will one day see that Jesus' resurrection was only the start. He was only the firstborn of the resurrection. In fact, listen, Pastor John's going to have me fired if we don't get back to singing. So give me a minute. In what is a commonly disputed but certainly historical part of Matthew's account, we see 
God giving a foretaste into what happens to the saints who love the Lord. Jesus dies, the earthquake happens, and the earthquake that God caused, again, it's passive. God caused it after Jesus died. It opened the tombs that were built into the side of the mountains. Makes sense. That's pretty cool. It's not the coolest thing. God did a great miracle, and he put air back into the lungs of some of those saints who had passed. And the heartbeat went from nothing, from flatline to ba-boom. Ba-boom, ba-boom. And, and, and he put strength in their legs to get up and walk out into the city after Jesus had already made his reappearance. And that's all because God had already put that same resurrection power in them that was in Jesus. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen? He does the same for us. Listen, don't call it a comeback. Rome, Rome thought... Rome thought that they could put out the light, but they don't have control over the power supply. Yes, Jesus died, but God has raised him from his grave. And what Matthew tells us is that Jesus' resurrection gave many saints a resurrection, which is only an appetizer at best, because it's nothing to be compared as far as what's to come for us if we believe. Listen to me. Listen to me. This is our hope. This is the Christian message. I don't care what you've heard out there. I don't know what media tells you. I don't know what bad Christians you've met. This is the Christian message. This is good news that Jesus gives us full access to God and the promise of resurrection. But it only applies. Here's the caveat. It only applies to those who are willing To acknowledge their sin and brokenness. And to place their faith in God through the finished work of his son. Faith involves confessing and believing. Exactly what the Roman centurion said himself. Truly, this was, this is, he always will be. The son of God. It's not to say he's a good teacher. I don't want you to miss this. It's not to say he's a good teacher or a moral example. Good teachers and moral examples don't claim to be God and lead thousands of people in deception. And Jesus, he never claimed to be either of those kinds of people. In fact, we learned Friday night, he was crucified because he publicly claimed to be God. And when the Roman centurion witnessed for himself what Christ had done, he couldn't help but to acknowledge that this man was no ordinary man. He is God in flesh. God come to earth. God with us and for us. And if that is true, then all of history hinges on this. At the very least, Our future and our hope depend on whether or not we are prepared to believe this good news. And more than that, our lives will be different because of who Jesus is and was. You can call him a historical figure. You can call him a religious teacher. And you can do whatever you want to go about your day. But if he is the son of God, then everything changes. Would you dare to believe this today? Would you trust in the sacrifice of Christ for your sins? Would you have faith that Christ has risen from his grave and that one day you will too? I invite you today, come humbly before the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. God, I thank you that (laughs) I was able to make it through that message. And Lord, we thank you that we have a hope. We have this hope as an anchor for our soul. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit 
would minister to the hearts of believers and unbelievers today. That you would pierce our hearts. That you would open our hearts to receive the word which was preached. And God, that we might leave here today different than how we came. Lord, we need these truths. Embed them, Lord, in us. Lord, the seed is planted. God, someone might water. But would you bring the growth? We praise you, Lord. You're good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing.
Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. Man, God is good, isn't he? Hey, let's see if you know this one. God is good. Oh, I love you. And all the time. Listen, Lucy, I'm going to have you lead that next time. What do you think? There you go. I like pudding. <laughs> yes and amen. Hey, what a great day in the house of the Lord. Amen. And uh, hey, just a few quick things. Uh, first, um, we have a time of fellowship between services each and every week. So we have a 9 and 11. And after this service, uh, we have breakfast out in the tent. We would love for you to come join us. It's completely free. Bagels, tea, coffee, uh, brownies. Frank's wife makes the best brownies. We got brownies. So uh, all kinds of breakfast stuff out there. Come sit around the table. It, it doesn't have to be awkward. Just come enjoy some breakfast. We would love to have you. Uh, secondly, uh, we do believe here at South Bay in worshiping the Lord through giving and generosity as he has called us to do. Uh, so listen, this is not for any of you who are guests with us today. If you call South Bay home, this is for you. Uh, but if you're with us today, we love having you. Nobody's going to look at you funny for not giving today. Uh, but if you want to give online, there's options on the screen. Uh, we invite you who are watching online to give. Uh, if you want to give physically, as you're heading out the doors today, our ushers are going to be there with baskets in hand. Uh, whatever you feel called to give, if you just want to uh, give towards the ministry of the Lord, uh, we do such uh, incredible things. There's so many ways that we get to bless this local community. And uh, that's because we're faithful in giving. And so I, I want to invite you, if you want to give on the way out the door or on the screens, you can follow those instructions. Let's just leave that up there, Travis. Uh, we'll just leave that up there. And then the last and final thing is, listen, uh, we went through the most essential, the most um, necessary story of hope and peace that we have, that we know of, the gospel of Jesus Christ today. And if you have yet to receive and to, to believe and receive, as John says, uh, the, the good news of Jesus Christ, who he was, what he has done on your behalf, on our behalf, uh, then I, I want to invite you uh, to, to, as I said before, acknowledge, listen, you can't lead your life on your own or the way that you, you think it should go. It, it only leads to destruction. And so to acknowledge that before the Lord and to place your faith in, in Him and in Christ and what He has done on your behalf to right your wrongs and, and what He has also given us in His Word. And so would you have faith in that, to believe in Him, to trust in Him? If that's you today, and you realize I'm coming to the end of myself, I've been looking for love in all the wrong places. If that's you, and you're ready to take that step, I want to invite you um, talk to the Lord about it first. He's the most important guy to talk to about that. But there's a connect card in the seats in front of you. And just write your name and your email and just check off that box that says, I place my faith and trust in Jesus today. We're not going to bombard you or embarrass you. We just want to pray for you. We want to be available to you. And so uh, leave that there and, and, and fill out that card and then just drop it in the baskets on your way out as well. Uh, otherwise, let me just pray a prayer blessing over us and then we will go. Lord, we thank you for today. God, you are good and you do good, Lord. And Lord, you have been very good to us this morning. And so, Lord, I pray this morning for all of us here in the room, everybody watching online, that, Lord, even as we have blessed your heart today, Lord, would you bless us and keep us? Lord, would you shine your face towards us? And, Lord, more so, would you give us your peace? In Jesus' name we pray and the church said... Amen. You may go in peace.